Well, hey, good morning, everybody. Great to be with you today. My name is John. If we haven't had a chance to meet before, I'm one of the pastors here. And I hope you're enjoying your summer so far, especially since this week it's going to be really, really hot. Um, I know we have a lot of people that go on vacations or maybe you're a camping family. It's an Indiana thing. I, I didn't grow up that way. You guys camp like I've never seen before. <laughs> Um, Anyways, uh, but it's a great time for picnics and whatever. Now, uh, summer for me is a little bit different. So I get excited about summer uh, for something I get to do later this week, and that's go to a a three-day music festival. Uh, There's a Christian music festival up north uh, that I get to go to with a couple of my kids, and I'm super stoked because for those of us that love live music, well, the pandemic kind of made us miss it even more, right? We realized what, what it was when it was gone. And so I'm excited. Um, if you know me at all, or maybe you've been with us for a while, so you've heard me speak before, you know that the music I tend to listen to, most of you just refer to as noise, right? Let's be honest. I, I listen to heavy and hard music. I'm a metal head. There's a lot of screaming. The more screaming, the better for me. Um, and I know not, of, not a lot of you like that kind of music. And so my guess is you've never been to one of those concerts, right? Um, it's just rows of people in black t-shirts. I wore a band black t-shirt today. This is War of Ages, one of my favorite Christian metal bands. Uh, we bang our heads up and down, and there's a mosh pit. I know, it's really weird. So what I thought I'd do is share the experience with you a little bit. Um, I brought some pictures so you can see what festivals are like. My first picture I got is uh, me with two of my daughters. This is Summer and Skies. At the end of a, a whole night, we're super sweaty, but completely worn out. We had a great time. Uh, next picture I've got is with a, a band from Missouri. They're a really good band called Bread for War. I get to see them this week. They're great guys. I love those guys. Um, here's actually a picture from a band's Facebook site. Now, this is the rows of black t-shirts. That's your pastor right there with his finger up <laughs> yelling, that's me. Um, and then, you know, concerts get tiring. So, so this, is, this is my daughter, Sky. She's here. She had no idea I put this picture in. But I don't know if we have any rap fans. Anybody know who Lecrae is? Anybody know Lecrae? Really popular uh, Christian rap artist. End of the day, super loud, so loud, your eardrums are bursting, and there she is, dead, <laughs> dead asleep. Anyways, we, we have a lot of fun. Uh, daddy-daughter headbanging is kind of a thing in my family, so I'm really excited. I'm going to go to my daughter, Sky, and then Ella. Um, a lot of you probably know Ella. She's been coming here since we started attending about seven years ago. She's a really good kid. She's got a big heart, loves to serve, so if you've got kids down in Kid Connection, she might be watching them right now. She watches kids at special events. Uh, She sings on the praise team from time to time. And as her sisters might say, because she's the youngest and the baby, she's spoiled rotten. Um, And Melissa and I would agree with that. But if you know Ella at all, uh, there's a particular two-word phrase that she uses more than any other words in the English language. And those words are, I'm sorry. She's our I'm sorry kid. I don't know if you've had one of those. Like you say her name and she just says, I'm sorry. You point to a random object in the room and she says, I'm sorry. You could run into her as she's standing still and she says, I'm sorry. Um, I don't know why. She doesn't know why. She doesn't have anything to apologize for. Doesn't know why she's saying it, but she just does. And Melissa and I, we've tried to figure out why is she our I'm sorry kid. And Some therapist will figure that out for us someday, I'm sure. Um, But anyways, the whole reason I decided to pick on her just a little bit today and the whole thing of I'm sorry is because we're going to explore something a little bit further today. We're going to tend to focus a little bit more on this whole concept of when we're given a little bit more time and perspective, all of us have the ability to cut ourselves a slice of this. We cut ourselves a slice of blame pie. Now, I don't know what your slice might look like. It might look like this slice here on the plate or not. But see, here's the thing. It's not fun and it's not easy to do. But like my dad said, it always takes two to tangle. So when given enough time, we can always find our slice of the blame pie. Because here's what we know. When it comes to relationships and relational conflict, someone is always to blame, right? Whenever there's relational conflict, someone is to blame. And again, you might not think it's you. In fact, everybody here, right? Here's what I know it's true. When there's relational conflict, we're not to blame, is it? Is it us? No. We're really mature to know that too. But sometimes, maybe every now and then, maybe a little bit, we own a slice of blame pie. And what we're going to talk about today is kind of this concept that when you're trying to repair a broken relationship, one of the best ways to do it is to take a slice of the blame pie. 
Well, we're in week three of the series called Reassembly Required, and this is a beginner's guide to fixing broken relationships. And I want to tell you, it's just a beginner's guide, right? This is not a master's level course, because if you're seeing a counselor and you're seeing a therapist, hey, stay with them, right? Because this is not an advanced course. And it may be that just because of this series and things that come up in this series, you may realize you need a more advanced course, and so you might need to see a counselor and a therapist. And that's great, because this is just a beginner's guide. And what we've established the first couple weeks of this series is that we're really good at starting relationships. We can be really good at maintaining relationships, but we're not so good at fixing broken relationships. And so sometime in your life when a relationship gets broken, which it's bound to happen, When relationships get broken, we tend to reach for the wrong tools, right? We tend to reach for the wrong things. And it's the C4 approach that we talked about the very first word. Here's the four four C's. We try to convince people or convict them, or we try to coerce them and control things to see things our way, to have our point of view. And even though we know those tools don't work, right? As many times as we pulled them out, they never work. And what's better is people have tried to use them on us. They've tried to control and coerce us. And we don't like that so much either. Even though we know all that, fixing relationships doesn't come naturally. So we still reach for the four C's. And what happens is these don't work. These don't work at all. And so we get frustrated because we're stuck again and we can't figure it out. And for those of us that are extroverts, I'm an extreme extrovert. Any extroverts out there? Yep. Extroverts always want to raise their hands. Um, us extroverts, we, we just start talking too much, right? When we get frustrated, we express ourselves way too much. Our hands start moving and things go crazy. And then you introverts in the room, and I won't ask you to raise your hands because you won't. You introverts, you just shut down, don't you? You shut down and you put walls up and we get more and more frustrated. And when we're frustrated in relationships, right, and someone asks us about the relationship, we tend to all fall into these three basic excuses or reasons why the relationship is where it is. And I think you're gonna find some of these familiar. The first excuse we have is, I don't care, right? Well, why don't you call him? Why don't you reach out to her and and try to figure this out? And we're like, meh. I don't care. You know, I've done all I can, and I I don't know if I care anymore. And if that's you, like, if you say, I don't care, it's actually something you need to pay really close attention to. Because actually, sometimes we say, I don't care, when we really care very deeply about something. Right? We we wouldn't say, I don't care about something we really don't care about, because then it wouldn't even cross our minds. A lot of times we say, I don't care, and what it really means is, I feel powerless to do anything about it. I may be telling myself I don't care, I may be trying to convince myself I don't care, but I'm just not sure what to do about this. And when we feel like there's nothing we can do about a situation, but we wish we could, those are actually things we care about very deeply. And so here's the problem when we say, I don't care. You could be trying to convince yourself you don't care, and you could walk away from that person or turn your back on the situation, but you know, all that energy and that emotion, that frustration, that anger, it, it hangs with us, doesn't it? It's like emotional baggage that we carry with us in life. It's emotional baggage we carry with us into the next relationship. And then when that relationship starts to get strained, which, by the way, is a lot easier to do when you're carrying emotional baggage, We don't know how to resolve it. And we're left more and more hurt saying, I don't care, but just feeling more powerless to do anything about it. The second excuse that we often give is, I already tried, right? Aren't you going to give that relationship another shot? Don't you you think that that relationship's worth giving them a call about? And we're like, nah, I already tried, right? I've done all I can. A lot of times when we say this, this this comes with the arm crossing, right? I I already tried. I'm waiting. I'm going to wait on them. I, I did what I can. I'll wait for them. And the problem with I already tried is something we've talked about these last couple weeks, that when relationships get broken, our goal, our personal goal should be no regrets. I mean, we may be moving towards reconciliation and want reconciliation, but Our goal can't be reconciliation because relationships aren't like a broken plate or a broken toy. You don't have all the pieces. You just can't glue this thing back together. 
Instead, our goal is when we lay our head at night on our pillow that we've got no regrets. That when our days on this earth have ended, and even if that relationship didn't fully reconcile the way we wanted it to, we have no regrets. That's our goal is to have no regrets. And when you have no regrets, if you remember what we talked about, you, you want to take down your walls. You're opening the front door. You're putting out the welcome mat and putting down the drawbridge and you're leaning into someone. But when you say, I've already tried and you take the posture of waiting, you're not leaning in anymore. In fact, the, the very first week, we, or I'm sorry, last week, we talked about the first of four decisions that we make when we want to reconcile a relationship. And the first decision was this. I'm going to get back to someone not back at them, right? That I'm taking retribution or what you have coming to you off the table. I'm not persecuting you. I'm not punishing you. I'm pursuing you. And that requires us to lean in. So when we're waiting and say, I already tried, we're completely leaning away from that. And actually it makes it so we've already undecided on this very first decision. And the last excuse, the last excuse we tend to make, and this is what we're going to be spending most of our time on today is this that it wasn't my fault anyways. I've said that before. I'm sure you've said that before as well. It's like, you know, shouldn't you call your mom? Shouldn't you call her and reach out? Shouldn't you talk to your dad about it? I mean, I thought you guys were like BFFs. What happened to you? Ah, it wasn't my fault anyways. And the problem with this, the problem when we say it wasn't my fault anyways, is that, it tends, it tends to make us want to wait, right? When we say it wasn't my fault anyways, that's when the narrative stops. That's when our talking stops. So when people ask you about any relationship and you say, it wasn't my fault anyways, you stop talking, done, not my fault, end of story. And if you've been tracking with us at all through the first two weeks of the series, you probably already realize that that's, that's really not the point, who owns which slice of the blame pie is not the point at all. Here's a, here's a fun little phrase to remember. Working towards reconciliation always begins with us regardless of who initiated the fuss. Now let me pause for a second. I'm a little sad that Seth, our lead pastor, is not here because he's the master of rhymes. And he has so many rhymes in his messages. He's, he's just really good at it. And I finally came up with one. He's not even here. So I'm pretty disappointed at that. But anyway, see, here's the really fun part about this, right? Always begins with us regardless of who initiated the fuss. Here's what we know. We know that the healthiest and the most mature person in any relational conflict should make the first move, right? Why? Because they're the healthiest and most mature. We know that. All right, second question. So for us, for any of us in the room, or if you're watching online today, in any relational conflict that we have, who is the healthiest and most mature person? Oh, come on, you know, you want to say it. We are, we are. They're not more healthy and more mature than, than we are, right? So if we're the healthiest and most mature, then who gets to go first? We do. Nobody wanted to answer that. Yeah, we do. We get to go first. And Listen, if you're here today and you're a Christian, right? You say you believe in Jesus and you're following Jesus with how you live your life. You don't have any excuse for this because we believe that God made the first move towards us while we were yet sinners, right? That Christ died for us on the cross before we made any move in his direction. And here's the thing, in our relationship with Jesus, we own 100% of that blame pie. Sin, that's all on us. But we read that for God so loved the world that he moved in our direction first, not to get back at us, not, I'm sorry, not to get back to us, but so we could get back to him. He didn't want to get back at us. And so what Jesus asks us to do as his followers is to have the same mindset. We looked at this the very first week that we're to love one another, not just to love, but the way Jesus loves us, which means we have to go first. We get to go first. We've got no excuses. He calls us to follow the example he set for us. And so this morning, as we explore this whole blame pie thing and who's at fault, we're going to be looking in the book of Matthew. If you have your Bible with, with, with you, you can turn there with us. I'm going to have it on the screen so all of us can follow along. Matthew is one of four biographies that we have on Jesus's life and Jesus's ministry while he was here on earth. And so we're going to be starting in chapter seven. Now, before I start reading this morning, some of you, for some of you, this passage may seem familiar. 
fact, for some of you, it's going to seem very, very familiar. And you might think, hey, didn't we read these same verses just like four weeks ago, John? I mean, seriously, John, out of 31,102 verses in the Bible, you couldn't find another verse to preach on. Seriously. And so if that's you, when we get there this morning, I got two responses I just want to head you off with. One, there really are 31,102 unique verses in the Bible. So that, if that's a Jeopardy answer, there you go. You're welcome. You're welcome. I helped you out right there. Second, if you remember, we covered the same passage. It was in the book of Luke, but the same teaching from Jesus. And it was in the Twisted series, and we were talking about judging others. So if you're judging me, you need to listen to that series again. Absolutely. <laughs> no, in, in all seriousness, it, we did cover this same teaching from Jesus. But trust me, these words and these teachings in this context on relationships is so brilliant and life-changing it sheds completely different wisdom on what we're going to talk about today. And you may be here today and you may say, you know, I'm not a Christian. I I don't know where I stand with God or I'm not sure who this Jesus is. And if that's you, I just want to tell you that I'm glad you're here. But I'd encourage you to lean into this message too and lean into this teaching. It may be familiar to you. You just don't know that Jesus taught it. And I'm telling you, it's so life-changing. And again, it's so brilliant that I think if you just want to try it and apply it to your life, it'll change everything. In fact, I think if you apply this to your life, you're going to see just how life-changing following Jesus can be. So here's what I want us to do. This is going to be a little different uh, in how we read this first, but here's what I want you personally to do. I want you to imagine whatever relational conflict you've got in your life. We've all got one, right? There may be one person out there that doesn't have one. And I want you to think of that situation and the person I want you to think of that brokenness and the situation. Maybe some emotion comes in there. And we're going to talk to Jesus for a second. Here's what we know about Jesus. We believe Jesus is God, right? And so because Jesus is God, he knows everything there is to know about us as people. He knows all about how we interact together. He knows about you. He knows everything about me. In your relational conflict, he knows everything there is to know about it. Who said what? Who did what? He knows that bitterness and that pain that you've gone through. And in the midst of that, right, in the midst of that, here's what Jesus does. He pulls up a stool, he sits right next to us, and he's going to get right up in our face and just ask us a really irritating question for a minute. And here's what he asks. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye? Right? I, I got a question for you. In, in your relational conflict you're going through, why are you focused so much on them? Whether it's your, your parents or your in-laws or a sibling, a friend or a coworker, a neighbor, whoever it is, why are you so focused on what they have going on in their life? Their issue, their slice of the pie. Because you know what? Their thing, you can't do anything about that. You can't. That's their thing. But I've got something you can focus on. I've got something you do have control on because this question mark not, isn't there in the verse. And so Jesus goes on and he says, you've got a plank in your own eye. That's what you can control. You have issues going on in your own life and in this conflict that you have control over. And when we read that in the midst of our relational conflict, we... We get a little angry sometimes, and we're like, all right, I hear you, Jesus. I've read these words before, but I just want you to get something straight. It's, it's not a speck that they have, right? It's not a thin slice of the pie. In fact, what they did, it's huge. I mean, he left me. She didn't follow through again. They said the most horrid things to me. She ruined my birthday again. He ruined Christmas again. So... Jesus, I know what you're saying, I get it, this may be good for most people, but in my situation, I know there's a lot going on in the world, so you probably weren't paying attention, but that's huge. It's a big deal to me, and from from where I'm standing, they can't even accept their own responsibility. Or sometimes we try to rationalize with Jesus in this verse, and we try to say, you know, I hear you, and no offense, Jesus, but you got this backwards, right? I've got the speck, and they have the plank. Because if I'm going to quote Billy Joel for a second, I didn't start the fire, right? It wasn't my fault. It was all their fault. He said it. She said it. They did it. 
And so from where I'm standing, and let me tell you, Jesus, my vision is perfectly clear. They have the majority of the blame pie. And so, again, Jesus, he scoots a little closer to us now, and he's like, that's interesting. That's, that's an interesting, interesting thought. So I've got a second question for you. And Jesus goes on, he says, how can you say to a brother, how can you say to anyone you're having emotional and relational conflict with, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? Right? Jesus is saying to us, how do you even think? How do you even think that you could go to someone and say, hey, let me sit down with you. Let me help you figure this out because I don't think you're seeing clearly. You might be broken or more immature than I am. I don't know what it is, but if you just sit with me and you give me enough time, you're going to see it my way, which is the right way. Jesus is saying, look, I don't know how you think you can perform a minor surgery on them because you need a massive, invasive procedure on yourself right now. It's not that you've got it all wrong. It's just you've got this out of order a little bit. Right? You still got more work to do. And then Jesus gets right up in our face with this next verse. And he says, you hypocrite. And we hate that word. Nobody likes to be called a hypocrite, but stop pretending. Stop acting like it's all their fault. First, and here's the priority, first we need to take the plank out of our own eye. And then, and only then, well, we see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye, right? So Jesus says, hey, before you sit down with them and try to give them a different perspective or help them know where you're at, you've got work to do on yourself. You've got to cut your piece of the blame pie. And again, for most of us, this is so hard to see. We, we don't like to see it. And so in any relational conflict that you're in, if you're here today and you're like, mm, it's all them, Right? It's not me. If you are having trouble identifying your slice of the pie, I've got a challenge for you. I've got a, a prayer that I'd encourage you to pray, and it's not easy. And even if you don't think that God listens to prayer, or you wonder if he answers our prayer, I want to challenge you to pray this prayer. And here's how it goes. It goes, Heavenly Father, please show me where I was at fault. Now, that's not the end of the prayer, but you might only get to this part and he starts revealing it to you. Because your heavenly father who loves you so much and is always honest with you, he wants you to see it. And then here's the rest of the prayer. Show me where I was at fault. Reveal to me how I could have acted or responded differently. Help me to own up to my slice of the pie. Help me to know where I went wrong how did I contribute to this mess? And I'm not going to take all the guilt. I'm not going to take all the blame. But since the only person I can be responsible for is me, I want to have no regrets. And if me is an obstacle to us, then I have the responsibility to own my piece of the blame pie. I need to identify it. I need to own it. I need to remove it. That is my responsibility. And it's not easy, I get it, because this is so hard. In, in relational conflict, this is one of the hardest things for us. And we don't like to admit it, but here's what we know is true. That all of us have a little bit of self-righteousness running through us. We do. We all have a, a little thread of self-righteousness running through us. And Jesus hated self-righteousness, right? That's why he railed against the religious leaders of the time. It's not because they were dumb or they weren't trying hard enough. It's just that they were so self-righteous and so focused on everyone else's spec that they weren't willing to look at themselves. And sometimes that's us. I mean, sometimes we, we want to point to and look at the spec in someone else's eye when we've got a freaking plank hanging out of our eye, but we're too self-righteous to even want to admit it's there. And when we're self-righteous, it limits our self-awareness and self-awareness is what paves the way to fixing broken relationships. And so that brings us to our second decision uh, and the four decisions we make when we're trying to reassemble relationships. Again, last week, our first decision was this, that I'm going to get back to, not back at someone, that I'm going to pursue and not punish. 
And today the decision we need to make is, I will own my slice of the blame pie. I'll take the time to look at it, find it, own it, remove it. Not so I'm the better person, not so I can just clear my conscience, but it's then and only then that Jesus promises us that we'll be able to see the relationship clearly. Actually, when you remove the plank from your own eye, you're in a much better position to get back to someone instead of at them. The Apostle Paul in the, in the book of Romans, in his letter he wrote to the church in Rome, he sums it, up, sums it up so beautifully. We looked at some of these verses last week, but here's what, here's what Paul says. He says, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. There's that, that self-righteousness. He goes on, says, do not repay, right? Don't get back at people. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. And then if you've never memorized a Bible verse before, never, this, this is a great one to start with. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. That when possible, as far as it depends on us, we have to live at peace with everyone, which means we have to own up to our slice of the blame pie. We've got to take care of ourselves first, which means this, that when we're reconciling relationships, it always begins in the mirror. It just does. It always begins in the mirror. It begins with us. And I know, I get it, depending on how deep that cut was for you, how long it went on, how much of an impact it's had in your life, that could be a really long and emotional time of reflection. But that's what we're called to do. That's what we're called to do, to own our peace. And if you've been sitting in hurt and bitterness for years or decades, our hope for you through this process is that you'll begin to find freedom, right? That you'll be able to let that go because you can't take care of the other person. You've tried that before. It doesn't work. You have to start with yourself. Now, when you're in a series like this, it, it's always really easy, even for myself, to kind of lean over to my spouse and whisper, hey, Charlie needed to hear this one, wish he was here, right? Or you get in your car and the first thing you say is, man, Bobby Sue, she needed to be here. She needed to hear that more than I needed to hear that. Some of you are trying to figure out how you can send these links for the sermons to your bosses without them knowing it was you. I get it. But here's the thing, here's the tough reality. If we're not willing to do something that we expect other people to do, do you know what that makes us? That makes us hypocrites. We have to start with ourselves. Own our piece of the blame pie. Remove it and fix it. And once you've done that, I've got another step for you. Once you've done that, I want you to reach out to that person that you have the conflict with. Right? If it's safe and appropriate, because it might not always be safe and appropriate, I get that, but if it is, shoot them a text, give them a phone call. If you like writing letters, write a, write a letter, send an email, maybe invite them to have a cup of coffee at Amex to sit down with you. Whatever it is and however you want to do it, you need to go first. Why? Well, because Jesus went first when it came to us, and so we should go first too. And by the way, you're the healthiest and most mature. So that's what you need to do. And here's what may happen. And you may have experienced this before. When you go first and you own your slice of the pie, when you're showing humility, because humility is a powerful relational dynamic, then you might be able to unlock something in that person that they could not unlock on their own. Because there's a lot of people walking around this world with extraordinary guilt because they know the pain they've caused. They know their slice of the pie, but they're, they're just too proud to admit it. And they build up this shell, this bravado over time. But your humility, your owning your slice, you going first, it may unlock in them something they couldn't unlock themselves. And they may be able to finally break through that shell and get on the road to the freedom that you're on. And it's when we do this, right? When we take the words and the teachings of Jesus and we put them into practice, this is, this is what following Jesus is all about. I mean, you may know these words, you might have heard these words before, but are you putting them into practice? He calls us not just to hear, but to do. 
And here's the crazy thing that happens. When you, when you do this and you own your slice of the blame pie, here's what happens. And I, I, think, I think you'll find this for yourself too. The more aware I am of what God has yet to do in me, the more I, aware I am of my plank, my slice of the pie, what I have to work on, well then, the less aware and actually the less consumed I am about what God has to still do in others. Right? The more aware we are of what God has yet to do in us, the less consumed we are about what he needs to do in other people because we've got to start with ourselves. We want to get back to, not back at. We need to own our slice of the blame pie. And shoot, just imagine what your family would be like, what our community would be like, what our nation would be like if we would just do this. Take the time to look in the mirror because the only people we can start with is ourselves. And that's where we'll pick it up next week. We're going to close out the series next week. You won't want to miss it. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, I come to you this morning and I I just thank you again for your amazing scripture that uh, keeps teaching. We have so much to learn. I know throughout this series, I've probably had some of the most difficult conversations of any series we've done because relationships are hard for a lot of us. There is pain and hurt, anger that we've been carrying around and we don't know what to do sometimes. And my prayer is that we will have the guts to be able to look in the mirror. That if we're having trouble looking in the mirror, that we'll pray for your help in identifying our slice of the pie. And that we'll go first because that's what you did for us is you went first. Help us to be a people that put this into practice. Help us to reconcile relationships in our own life, and help us to have no regrets.